Okay, so welcome everybody. Good evening, good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is the Red Wheelbarrow and tonight I'll be your host. I am Nondwen Boma and this is an honor today because we are hosting Gate Komasinga. And this is her first time at the Red Wheel Barrow. So if you don't know who she is, where have you been? Where have you been in these poetry circles? Um, I'm going to start off the night. I'm going to start us off by reading a poem. And then I'm going to introduce Ngatego. And then I'm going to leave the floor to her. And then we're going to have a Q&A at the end of her reading, a short five minute break, and then an open mic session. For the open mic, you're welcome to share any poem, a poem by yourself, a poem by a poet that you like, all is welcome. Okay, so tonight's poem that I have, uh, that I'm going to share, is a poem by Romeo Oriogun. I am probably butchering that surname, but uh, he's a Nigerian poet, and the po the title of the poem is Invisible Man. Visible Man. And the voice was a lost bird embedded in a boy, like a word stranded between pages. He said, flee from the heat wrecking your body. And you ran to a place where water running over pebbles is a whisper of wilderness, where lost boys are birds hiding their heads under wings as they touch their wetness in the dark and whisper, hallelujah. The radio said, a father shot his son for loving another man. Marvin Gaye lives in the heart of a black drag queen. And to be a song of pebbles and water is to run into a city of light and surrender your throat to the song of a bird. On the streets of Lagos, a boy searches for himself in mirrors. He opens his heart and hears the voice of his father, breaking his bones into a prince collecting bird teeth, lying as a warning on holy grounds. This is how we kill love, hunting it in the dark when it is soft like a newborn chick, breaking its bones till it becomes a boy filled with dead men. Rainfall teaches the ground how to breathe. A boy learns about the wetness of his thighs on a cold night, Poster of boys diving into water holds him in a trance. A horse hears the coming of speed rising in his blood. A horse responds to the call of wind hills as water tickles the sky. Wet dreams. A boy hears the whisper of another boy deep in his bones and wonders about the origin of stars. His body is a lamp learning how to give light in a place where a boy opens his mouth from the door of a tomb, where a boy takes his first breath and resurrects into life, where a boy learns how to make honey out of a skin. This is how to live. A resurrected boy hides in dark bars and stare at muscles of hard men. He is called Joe. He is called John. He is called the wind. And that is how to be seen. And this is real. A man hides his voice in a throat before bursting out into songs. Verbs are boys learning how to kiss. Like you turning your body into a blue sea. Turning your lips into pictures of love. Like you opening your body into a little island. Opening your skin into a beautiful world. Verbs are boys learning how to love. In a place where death lives in water. One step at a time, a boy learns how to dance. His voice in a stream learning the music of the ocean. He opens his mouth and paints blue skies with the magic of flying. He opens his hands and flowers plate the air with music. One step at a time, a man kisses another man and hears bullets hitting his windows. A man kisses another man and hears a mob running on his skin. A man lies on the edge of bliss and hears the rape of boot doors. Still, we rise with the sun and plant seeds of love in dark places. Still, 
We love and hide and wait for the rapture inside a boy's body as a voice flirts with the birds in his throat while a man burns on a street in Lagos for singing too loud. With that, I welcome Kate Gomasinga. Uh, Kate Gomasinga is an award-winning South African writer and scholar. She is a 2019 Fellow of the Ebedi International Writers' Residency, a 2018 Mandela Washington Fellow, and a Golden Key Scholar. She was nominated for the Pushkat Prize in 2018, and her work has received support from the Pro Helvetica Johannesburg, the Swiss Arts Council, the Hoot Institute South Africa in partnership with Hear My Voice, the Center for Creative Arts, and others. In 2019, she co-wrote, uh, she co-won the Brittle Paper Anniversary Award. Gatte was the director of the Intention Program at Africa in Dialogue, as well as the founder and managing director of Ntsugu Publishing, of Ntsugu Publishing Consultancy. She participated in the University of Iowa's 2021 International Writing Program. Her poetry has been translated into French, Bengali, Tamil, and Romanian. Her latest body of work is titled Daughter Wound, and it's forthcoming with UK publisher Hazel Press in April 2014. And if that has not impressed you, I will leave you to Ngateko Masinga to serenade you with her poetry. So Ngateko, welcome. We are so honored to have you at the Red Wheelbarrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. It's such an honor. Thank you to everyone who has taken time out of their evening to be here to listen to some poetry. I know you could be anywhere else, but you decided to be right here. So hopefully I'll make it worth your while. Um, so let's get into it. So we actually had a request for a poem um, from Mohau. Mohau has supported me from the very beginning of my poetry career. So if Mohau says poetry request, then I will honor that. And he only gave me one clue in the chat. Um, the poem that he asked for is called um, Feeding Scheme Love, but the clue that he gave was Open Hands. So this is Feeding Scheme Love. Where did you learn to love with open palms? Not at home. Mama taught you to pray with your hands clasped together. Even babies clench their fists. Why don't you? Where did you learn to love this way? So hungry, so desperate, so weak. Who taught you that love was a, a feeding scheme cue? Who said that time was served in spoonfuls? How much do we need? An hour, a day, a lifetime. Who taught you? Who taught you? I'm sorry, I've lost the poem now. Who taught you that space can be gift wrapped and given as a present? How much do you need? A room, a house, the universe? Let us learn together. When he said that he had space for you, he meant a seat on a bus that would never arrive. And time, time meant that he would feel no hint at rem of remorse when you finally realized that neither his clock nor his calendar knew you by name. So I'm honestly wondering if that is the poem that Mohal was requesting, because I'm thinking that there must be another open palm there's one poem that actually speaks of palms specifically. I will look for it. But for now, I'm going to go into the set that I had prepared for today. Um, but Mahal, I hope I've honored your request, even if it wasn't the exact poem you were looking for. So this set, um, I'm starting with poems in 
um, a little grouping that I'm titling Seasons, and I'm going to move into another one called Fireflies. And then the last one is going to be Love Poems. So we're going to start with Seasons. The first poem in Seasons is called A Portrait of the Year as My Lover. And so what I do in this poem is that I imagine that an upcoming year is my spouse. And why I did that is that if I've had a particularly difficult year, I always tell myself, in order for me to go into this new year with love, I have to convince myself that I love this new year and it loves me too. So I wrote this a couple of years ago when I had been having a very difficult year and going into a new year, I told myself, you and I are married, me telling this new year, you and I are married, we're going to make this work, it's going to be a good year. A portrait of the year as my lover. It has been raining for as many hours as we have been married. I, still pink with the bliss of passion consummated, place my finger on your chin and you stir, a sign of life. I want to lay here and read my vows to your gently heaving chest. In a noisy crowded room, I made a promise. You smiled and said that you would be here and I could count as slow as I wish to 365 and you would still be standing next to me. It was no dream. You are indeed here. I accept that your arrival is in itself a promise, a vow carved on this bed as we await, curtains drawn, the rise of the new sun to embrace our newlywed joy. And so that is where I am with 2024. We are newlyweds and we are working it out. We are one month in and it's going well and hopefully it will continue that way. This one is called A Cheat Sheet for Changing Seasons. <laughs> the day they set the clocks back to standard time, I draw the curtains and whisper, I'm losing you. As you take a photograph and say, you'll love this one. Loss must be immortalized. Please take another picture. We examine the camera roll and imagine captions. Exhibit A, I wear forever 21 with midlife lethargy. Exhibit B, I cry at weddings and birthday parties and charge by the hour, tissues not included. We collapse into laughter, then tears. Every tragedy has a soundtrack and a director. Even the Uber driver has a cameo role and a fake name in this movie. You call me beautiful and add, a curator will not have to think hard to caption this. Everyone recognizes a broken beloved. I say, please go. Your plane departs in seven hours. Why mourn what was never ours? Not even our mothers can claim us anymore. We have grown new limbs to escape new wars. I shove a towel into my mouth and scream. I will miss you, but only if you go. The day that they set the clocks to daylight saving time again, I will open the door and say, welcome home as you lean in for a photograph and say, this lighting is terrible. We will not examine the camera roll this time. No picture can do justice to perfection. Every reunion has a soundtrack and a director. Even the Uber driver has a supporting role and perhaps a handwritten invitation to our wedding. But in order to re return, you have to first leave. So please go, your plane departs in six hours. So that one is about um, long distance relationships and trying to maintain connections over space and time and challenges that exist. So yeah, this one is called Semester Test. For 10 marks, 
find the lost girl in the image provided. Essay question. Tell her why grief is not a halfway house. Tell her why love is not Lego, build, destroy, break, rebuild. Tell her that love is not fixed with glue. Tell her that hearts are not fixed with glue. Practical, take the lost girl to an altar call. Give her a seat near the offering basket. Tell those with alms to lay hands on her. This next one is about war. Um, so back in my day, back in my day, I dated a, a soldier. So this poem was actually um, in honor of that person. A car's headlights illuminate our driveway, two beams moving closer, arms reaching out to embrace me. When you spoke of arms, you meant the artillery that you took in defense of borders. So I will speak of hands instead. It is your hands that I want now reaching out to me. On deployment day, you picked up everything except me. You buried your face in my shoulder and said, love and war are the two things that I know best. They stand side by side like a car's headlights, each burning from a different bulb. Sometimes one will become dim before the other. Either I will come home to find love still burning or war will rage on with love as its casualty. A car is parked in my driveway. Its license plate tells me everything that I need to know. The war has not ended, but your journey has. In theater, a curtain call is an actor's final bow. The audience claps. In war, there are curtains too. And here is one with a family behind it, anxious for news. Sometimes there is a call to confirm, and this is a soldier's final bow. But this time, nobody claps. This next one is called While the World Was Burning. So I, I write love poems. The world will be on fire and I will be writing love poems. Everything will be falling apart and I'll be writing love poems. So this is in honor of the unwavering devotion to love. I wrote you love poems while the world was burning. I became water and doused the flames your body was engulfed in. I loaned you my body, charred from the womb, can't burn what is already black. I did not get out in time to save myself. I remember the night that I stayed up. It was midnight here and it was sunset where you are. And I asked you, do I leave my country or do I stay and build a better one? And if I want to leave, where do I go? And if I want to build, who has the tools? And you said, love, I can't speak now, the sky is on fire. But when I looked up, all I saw were ash and embers. This one is a follow-up to semester test and it's called Re-Exam Old House. I wore gray and I walked to our old house, gliding through the yard like a tired ghost. I asked questions. Who answers the phone now? Who waters the flowers? Who fetches the post? Nobody answered. Clouds gathered above my head and I remembered that rain had not forgotten us quite as ruthlessly as time had forgotten. The next day, I wore black and I came back. I mourned you properly. 
I took down the pictures from my mind's gallery. Now I look up and the sky is blue again and I am wearing white and we are building a new house, you and I. Here the walls do not close in on you. Here the walls desperately want to look like you. What are you made of? Mahogany and gold. This next one is titled Seven Lessons on Phosphorescence. So this was actually inspired by a fire that broke out in a hospital in Johannesburg. One, remember all that you have been taught about fire. Ceremonial bonfire, Dante's Inferno, Hades, the burn wounds practical in the skills lab. Two, remind yourself that this is not an airplane. There will be no oxygen mask descending from above. There will be no option to stabilize yourself. Three, run to the pediatrics ward. Think about what you learned in physics, energy transfer, speed. Hold children in your arms. Cry when alone, hold smoke in your mouth, cough when alone. Four, make your mandatory check-in phone call. Say to your partner, love, I'll be home late, don't wait up. Say nothing about the flames. Remember that this fire is not unlike you, fluorescent and effervescent, burning beyond the call of duty. The scabs remain. Five, watch the fire die down. No more combustion, no more perceptible heat. The scabs remain. Some evidence is indestructible, so speak. Six, tell your lover what the fire did to you. Count on your hands the ones that it took. Stop holding smoke in your mouth. Speak. Seven, tend to what remains in the aftermath. Re-establish the scaffolding of your body. Brittle, so brittle, but relearning the beauty of water. So we are done with the seasons. Um, that was the first part of tonight. And now we're moving on to Firefly. So the Fireflies are a series of poems that I started late last year. And basically they go through the stages of a relationship, starting with when you're still trying to figure out if this is something you want to pursue. And obviously the inception of love is always sweet. So the first poem is, you know, it's love and desire. And as we move on, there's some pain and I think um, I used the image of a firefly throughout this series because I wanted something that was constant even in the changes that occur when you love someone there has to be something that remains constant and for me it was this image of the firefly so this first one is a firefly in the palm of God Perhaps a spark, an inkling of possibility beyond desire. Perhaps a raging forest fire. Perhaps we slow dance in a burning room. Perhaps we try to outrun it all. The wars, the revolving door of RIPs and I'm sorry's, the fires, the fires, the fires. Perhaps we whisper, a sweet winged hello, a firefly in the palm of God. This next one is a firefly flailing in a glass jar. I wanted to love you without your voice being a small God to whom I offered myself at night, a threshing floor sacrifice, clandestine, 
not destined for or deserving of the morning light. I wanted ceremonial bonfire, drums and drunken delusion to distract me from the pain of your departure. I wanted to feel something beside the ache of longing. I wanted to rid myself of regret. I wanted to throw myself into the fire and say that you burned me. You did, didn't you? You found me sober, yet not quite sane. Nobody with sense abandons their, their hearts at a terminal. The onward journey and its pain are inevitable. You threw a match, the fury swirled in my blood. I tried on my empty ribcage. Nobody knows about you. I tend to my wounds in silence, a firefly flailing in a glass jar. This next one is a firefly with angel wings. Swept up in the wonder of flight, as ignorant as Icarus must have been to wax and feathers inadequacies against the sky's fire in residence, I burned and fell. There is no shame in watching my makeshift wings melt, but only the pain of peeling, merging with my mistakes so permanently, so irrevocably ruined, doomed to hell. Will you make me a myth in your mind, a cautionary tale about the cauldron of uninhibited desire? Make me small and immortal, a firefly with angel wings. This next one is a firefly in hell's crosshairs. I wish you were here to share how you brawled with death while she counted her coins, casually throwing glances your way as her tally rose. How you evacuated yourself when you were the house on fire, draped in crime scene tape, lady of the manic manor. How you made an antidote when you were the poison, swallowing lost men whole and spitting their lungs out. I wish you were here to see how I bear grief's weight in the soft arm of memory. This is how I think of you, a firefly in hell's crosshairs. This is a firefly at the communion table. I acknowledge that I am no martyr. I falter through the Our Father. I remember clearly the cracked cadaver that I dissected. The man had a name. Then only a tag on his foot, barcoded property of the institution. I acknowledge that I am no hero. I threaten the throat of memory with this admission. I almost died in medical school. I had a name, then only debt and illness, labeled property of the institution. I acknowledge that I am no saint. I take the silver, I give the kisses. I flutter for a chance at living, a firefly at the communion table. This is a firefly on the witness stand. You wanted someone to live with, an accomplice, a co-conspirator. I was there, too single and sinful to resist you. What was one more to my litany of trespasses? Surely I could add to my tally and tell the tale posthumously if need be. Surely I could slow dance in hell if the music distracted me from the sizzling of my wings. Surely I could weigh my transgression on the scale of my own conscience and offer myself an acquittal. Surely you can do the same now. Find a sliver of your severed soul and offer it to a worm a chrysalis pending, an emanchioma of me with no priors, 
only a penchant for all that is beautiful and tortured. If I am sentenced to death, then let it be by fate's sleight of hand. I did only what love asked of me, a firefly on the witness stand. This one is the last one in the Firefly um, series, and it's a firefly on a conveyor belt. I watch my past spin and spin, sickened by my body's blunt refusal to lunge at it. I lack the enthusiasm that is required to grab what is mine and admit that it is mine. Who, when meeting again what has wanted them dead, says to it, come home with me? And who, when shown a gun, unbuttons their shirt and marks an X on their chest? Our love is alive, ablaze and pirouetting towards me, a firefly on a conveyor belt. So this last part is the love poems. So I've always told myself that I'm a love poet, but I then go back and I read the poems and I'm like, hmm, this is a bit sad. I don't know if this is about love, um, but I think that there is some love um, in these poems. Uh, so this one is Love Poems for the Ides of March. So the Ides of March is basically March the 15th. And back in the day, way, way back, um, in the times of Julius Caesar and them, the Ides of March were basically the time when people had to pay their taxes. That was D-Day for everything. You had to have your taxes in. And it's also um, coincidentally the day that Julius Caesar was assassinated. So it doesn't have very good... Uh, memories attached to it so there was a particular year where March was not a good month for me it was, things were just not going well and so I decided I'm gonna write a poem and try and you know tell the Ides of March that let's be friends in the same way that I tried to do that um, at the beginning of a new year so I did that that particular March um, and so this is love poem for the Ides of March Time, a continental walkway between us. Your eye, conqueror of all barriers, sees me. Sees me for your delight and I will linger beyond daybreak. Come atop and take flight. The sea is restless, abides the tides and does not wash you ashore to me. I will long for you beyond this life. And though they say beware, I want you still. Come again midway and leave only when I am gasping, cut in two. So there was some wordplay there with Julius Caesar. Um, so there's um, seize, seize me. So I, I was just, um, I decided that I was going to put a pun in there and not reference Caesar directly and just use some other words and be creative with it so yeah this next one is called psalm for chrysanthemum so this poem is actually the title poem for my previous poetry collection which yeah titled psalm for chrysanthemums it's the first poem that i wrote as part of that collection so it has a special place in my heart and yes it's a love poem the flower of the month was in crisis. At first, the heading of the article startled me. It said, mums are not flowering. I looked again, realizing that I was reading a gardening magazine with closed chrysanthemum bud buds dis displayed. It was November, the month that our love blossomed and I wished we could give a petal or two away to the poor chrysanthemums. You laughed and said that I was silly, and that I should just pray for rainfall. So I did. I prayed all week, 
I chanted rain, 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 and the chrysanthemums flowered that Saturday. Rain is another name for love, I am certain, because I am now in our old garden, kneeling again. This time for us, for love to grow in your heart again. And so I chant love, love, love on a night in mid-February, out of season, but just in time for a few chrysanthemums and maybe for us. So these last two poems are in honor of my late best friend. Um, she passed away 12 years ago. Um, yeah. Heroin. Press backspace once and hello turns to hell. Even lover without the L spells over. My friend, my beloved, when you said heroin, I thought you needed me, not the drug. Either way, I wasn't there. Press backspace once and heroin turns to heroin. Check view history once and you turn to drugs and I to soft rock and boys, both of us too far gone. Press the space bar once and beloved turns to be loved. Oh, be loved. Please be loved, wherever you are. Rest easy, assuage my guilt. Dial 10 triple one and nobody saves either of us. I thought we were taking it together, this life trip. It's no fun without you. I have been jaywalking since you walked away and I will be guilt tripping until I join you up there. This one is 14 lines make a sonnet or an overdose. What happened? I rehearsed the end. I took in my lines and told them how I found her or didn't. Who was there when she died? A single line can end a life. A couplet ends a sonnet. It always goes this way. Two liars. One alive and saying nothing, the other hovering, desperate to come clean. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ngateko. Can we please unmute and give Ngateko a huge round of applause? Mm -hmm. You can permanently unmute. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I I have so many questions. Um, I don't know if I should even first go ahead or let pe other people go ahead. Um, but I I really liked your first section. I thought it was both hilarious and tragic. I I mean, I mean I think that goes for your entire reading. It was both like humorous, loving, and wholesome, but also just incredibly tragic um and that's weird because you call you 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 stated that you're a love poet and you're yeah you you're somebody who loves writing about love and I guess I'm not struggling with it but I'm thinking love is so tragic like, if that is love I don't want it it's beautiful but tragic okay so I'm gonna stop and leave room for other people to talk and then somewhere in between, ask my own questions. <laughs> so are there any questions in the room? Jacques, please go ahead. Hi, Nongre. I'm not sure that I can be heard. You can be heard, but you are mm -hmm. in the dark. <laughs> I see, yes. That figures. Um, am I visible now? Uh, you're not visible. Initially, you were visible, but your room was just dark. I think you don't have the lights on. I can see an outline of you. <laughs> now we can see you. Now the light is on. Yes. So I've okay, seen and heard. That's for a dramatic entrance. Okay. 
Petsenko, that was such a beautiful reading. I love the fieriness of the Firefly poems. So I have a, a question from, from, from one love poet to another. Um, for me, there's a beautiful tension in those love poems because there's something you, you speak, I think you speak about the, the longing and the, and the fear of being consumed, you know, like love does. And at the same time, the longing to be small and and immortal, like to, to become a poem. Um, and I felt that tension in the poem where you ask the lover to leave. You know, if I, if you don't leave, I can't miss you and I can't write a poem about, about it. Do you, is that right? Is that, is that the tension? You've, is, would you say that that tension between between being, you know, surrendering to that experience and standing back and writing the poem, is that part of what, what energizes you? That tension between those two things, or is that just me? Um, I think it, it depends on the situation. I think there are cases where it's being being engulfed or being at the mercy of this love is it's 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 a good feeling but then there are times where you feel or where i would feel like i'm losing myself in whatever the experience is and that's where i'll try and pull away and say okay you know if in order for you to return you have to leave you know, and that is me trying to figure out if I still exist in the midst of whatever this thing is that is created. Because I believe that a relationship is a world that you are building with this person. But at some point, you can lose yourself in that world and you start to wonder if you still exist or yeah. if you've just been engulfed in whatever this is. So there is definitely that push and pull so in some poems there is more of a push and some there's a pull in some it's just I surrender yes take me I accept you are <laughs> I you know yes, yes. Um, and then in some cases it's like hold on I don't know who I am anymore and then you sort of try and um, pull back and and build yourself back together so there is definitely an underlying tension there. There is a constant push and pull and a negotiation with the self to say, is this what I want? Is this where I want it to be? And like I said, the inception of love is always sweet. But as you go along, then you start to experience all of these uh, clashing emotions. And then you wonder if you've lost yourself in the process. And definitely, I think... Um, what I try to evoke in, in the poems, just that uncertainty and the desire to still hold on to the self in the midst of that. Well, I think it's very true. Can I, can I squeeze in? Can I just quickly ask, who are some of your favorite love poets? Whom do you love reading most? Ooh. That's a hard one. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> that's a very difficult one, but I I love Sylvia Plath, and I guess some people would be like, "Is is was she speaking about love? Was that love?" But um, yeah, I I love Plath, um, because I feel like she spoke about the reality of love, and the the difficulties of love um and so a lot of my work is in honor of the madness also that that is encompassed by being in love and 
Yeah, I would say that is the one person whose work has made me feel like this is the type of love that I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Ed, I see you, but in the chat, there are some questions. Um, Sally, I think, was following up on what I had sort of asked. Um, where do you find it in you? Where's the power of force to keep writing about love when it keeps maybe being lost? Um, yeah. Ooh. I think the desire to try again is always there. And like I said, with each new year as well, I I want to try again with a new year. I want to try again with a new person, you know? So I'm always like, you know what? The previous year has ended. We are going into a new one. We are trying again. The previous relationship has ended. Here's a new person. We are trying again. So I, I will always always have space to love again I I will always love again regardless of what happens yes I will take the time to heal and I will take the lessons with me I think there's also we have to be careful about how much we allow ourselves to endure in the name of love and I'm not saying that I will endure everything um, there is a limit to that. There is a point where I can say, you know what, I have loved you with all that I have, but I cannot, this can't be an offering basket love where I keep giving and giving and giving. And next thing I'm, you know, jumping into that basket and saying, I surrender, the church may have me, you know, I am the offering. But so I think that there comes a point where I have to say, I have to preserve myself. I can only be available to the next year or the next relationship or whatever phase I'm going into if I am whole and if I am healing. And so I'll always try again, always. Please, I'll always try again. <laughs> Love is worth trying again. <laughs> it's always worth another shot. <laughs> Love to hear it. Okay, Ed, please go ahead. Hey, no, no. Hi. Kateko, I thoroughly enjoyed your reading. I um, definitely heard um, an echo of Sylvia Plath in the, in the line, uh, swallowing lost men whole and spitting their lungs out. Um, yeah, I, so I don't really have a question. It's more an appreciation. And um, I think that the Firefly series is just is such a brilliant device. Um, a way to sort of thread an idea and sort of explore a relationship, like you said, um, just deeply imaginative. I, I found them, yeah, lovely. And, and also the stakes are high. Um, another thing I found I enjoyed, the stakes are high in the relationship poem. They thank you. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate that. Um, I think Ed was kicked out. Oh his, no! Yeah, no. There's a problem with his network. I think, yeah. Um. So, just when you were reading while the world was burning, I was thinking of this other poem by jo Joy Harjo, um. And the title of the poem is "Perhaps the World Ends Here," and it's kind of like a ridiculous mm -hmm. sort of yeah. It's it's a beautiful poem. It's a beautifully short poem, and um I, I wrote notes I am a notes taker <laughs> a portrait of the year as my lover that had resonances of the title of Sinjama Gona's like first collection of poetry um which is play, please take photographs so that whole mm -hmm. please don't take photographs was kind of for me resonant I kept thinking the idea of not and versus the idea of taking photographs and why one would be persuaded to and why one wouldn't. And I think your poem was kind of on the side of why one wouldn't. Um, mm -hmm. And the line where you say um, something about perfection, like why take a photograph of something that's already perfect? And that was beautiful. I I devoured that line. Um, and the <laughs> day was mean. Um, seven lessons on fluorescence. That was... 
I don't know if beautiful is the right word to describe something so tragic. It's almost like a warning. Is it supposed to serve as a warning or is it supposed to serve as something that consoles one after something bad, something tragic has happened? Because I sort of didn't know where to place myself. I was like, this this sounds like a warning. But towards the end, as you get closer to the end of the poem, it's sort of like, well, now that this has happened, you know, this is what you do. So with that poem, there's a bit of reality in there because sometimes when you work in a particular field, there are certain things that you can't disclose to people outside of that field. So I was speaking to the forced silence of having to endure something like a fire and a fire in which people lose their lives and not being able to say anything about that to the people that you love. And then obviously later being cleared to, to share. Um, so that poem speaks to the silences that we are forced to and also just the, a gentle nudging to speak and to not hold the pain in and not, not hold the trauma in. Um, so it references an actual incident and also imagines one person who is in that situation and is not able to disclose what is happening while it's happening. But now they get out and there is obviously uh, the counseling and debriefing that has to happen and them now having to speak up. And that's why the end of the poem is just the encouragement to speak. Because when you are so used to not speaking up for yourself, it's very difficult now when they say, now it's time for you to share your story because it, it's very difficult. Everything in you is pushing against that impulse. So yeah, um, there, there's a lot that, everything that you said is in that poem. And I think for me, it was, I was just trying and because it's packaged in, um, in these numbers, because I'm trying to, to figure out at which point I am it's like the stages of grief it's not it's not chronological it's cyclical you can go through anger and then go to depression and then go to to bargaining and then go to acceptance and then cycle back to depression and so with anything that you're healing from or anything that you're recovering from sometimes you go you speak and then you 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 are then pushed back into silence and sometimes you are reliving the situation. You're there in the pediatrics ward and you're thinking, am I doing the best that I can for these children that are relying on me? So it's all of these things that are happening simultaneously. And you're trying to figure out how you package that in your brain, especially in hindsight, when you're trying to figure out if you made the right decision in that moment. So... Yeah, the seven lessons, you can learn whichever lesson you need to at whatever time. Um, it's not necessarily from one to seven. Sometimes you speak first and then the flashbacks come. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, everybody who comes to the Red Wheel knows I love a list poem. I love list <laughs> poems. List poems are delicious. They're my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some me of too. Really, I I love me a list. I think it organizes my brain in such a particular way, and it 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 emphasizes on anything. If it's a love poem, mm -hmm. it's like the love just is bound. Like there's bounds and bounds of love. And if it's grief, <laughs> there's just like death gripping grief and so I don't know it organizes my mind in a way that my mind is not organized it's almost like a like a list poem comes and sorts out everything in my brain <laughs> there is some appreciation in the chat um okay. so you have Mohawu what a gift in Katek or Masinga 
Um, and Sally, thank you, thank you so me. much, feeling inspired to take the same approach. So Sally is trying to love again. You have you have changed hearts. <laughs> <laughs> you have yes. Robin, really enjoying your poems. Thank you, Mahal. One thing I love about Gatego's writing is her understanding of linguistics. Um, Ed, hi Gatego, I enjoyed the deeply imaginative quality of the poems. And that the stakes are often high, whether in the relationship poems or the poems about the fire, for example. Also enjoyed the wordplay in the last two poems. My favorite line, I flutter for a chance at living. Mm. Um, yeah. So are there any other questions in the room? If there are none, I usually say I'm a death poet. So, and you say you're a love poet. I feel like whenever I write poetry, I move, I go from death to living as opposed to living towards the death, to towards the dead or death. Oh, English today. Um, yeah, so my movement is always from the grave outwards as opposed to going into the grave. So would you say that's the same impulse for you? So even if it's a love poem, it turns tragic because you're moving from a place of love would you okay All yeah right. interesting absolutely interesting okay um i think we'll all we'll stop there if there are no questions and there are no more comments uh can we please unmute and give Gatego one last round of applause for this beautiful conversation this beautiful reading completely and utterly <laughs> enjoyed this session okay so we're gonna take a five minute break uh so right now it's 8 31 so we'll be back at 8 36 uh for an open mic it will not be recorded so no worries i'll stop the recording now um and i'll see you guys in five you can have something to drink take a breather go to the bathroom and we'll see each other in five Oh, <laughs>